Hey, this is Brennan Kelm from the band American Standards. You know, today you're not only listening to the discography discussion, but you're also dancing around! You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 133, Hope for the Dying, hosted by Dan Terry. You can buy beer pretty much anywhere in Missouri. And Joseph Wren, all night long, depending on who's asking. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if your beautiful day for vengeance ends in a city of corpses, then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe, that is Dan, and I love playing Left 4 Dead 2. Can we do that now, please? Uh, I don't think we're going to play it right now. Maybe a little bit later. I could totally play it. I've got three screens going on. There's a giant 50-inch television on the wall. Dan can talk about Hope for the Dying. I can kill zombies. Everybody wins, except for the listener, because we don't have a camera set up yet. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you can do that. I can't really join you as I'm, uh, while well, I'm doing this podcast, number one. Horrible multitasking skills. I, I am very bad at it. And uh, I'm also, all I have is a shitty MacBook Air, so it's it's not going to really run left for dead. I think it can handle it on low settings. It's that old. <laughs> the fact that I can access the internet with it is kind of an amazing, amazing feat of engineering technology. What is that, a wireless G card in that? I don't really know. It's, you know, the MacBook is so thin and light and weird that it's like walking around with a potato chip, really. Really only one potato chip? Yeah, like just one. Who just wants one potato chip? I could tell you stories. Well, I want to tell you guys some stories tonight about Hope for the Dying, but I know Joe's not going to let me get to that just yet. The listener is here for Hope for the Dying, so feel free to fill them in. Well, Hope for the Dying is a metalcore band. Okay, maybe that's not really doing them service. They're more metal than core. The vocals are kind of core, but these guys are these guys are super metal, super proggy, a lot of keyboards. Like these, these guys listen to a lot of Iron Maiden, like a lot. That really shows through in their music. They definitely, if they're a band that you've skipped over at some point because you're like, oh, I don't really know if I want to listen to a band like this, they're, they're not what they look like. They're not what you're thinking. You say Iron Maiden. I say these guys are clearly fans of Between the Buried and Me. It's almost a more tame version of what Between the Buried and Me is doing at times. They have that little proggy moment where they want to be Dream Theater or they want to be Between the Buried and Me, but then they just play a straight riff that doesn't really require complex counting, and then they screw it up again and give you that complex counting. It's definitely a tame version of progressive death metal at times. Well, and that is what they're tagged as, is progressive death metal. And I think that's a pretty fitting comparison, or at least a a fitting description. However, I don't get as much of the death metal out of this. I hear a lot of metalcore. I hear a lot of traditional metal riffing. I hear a lot of weird time signatures. It's like they listen to bands like Opeth and Between the Buried and Me, but they're trying really hard not to sound like that. It's like somebody took Between the Buried and Me, listened to Colors, listened to The Great Misdirect, and said, I want to do that, but I want to clean it up. I want it to be like this Dream Theater album from 1996, from a production standpoint, of course. Yeah, I don't really hear that, but I wasn't a big fan of Dream Theater in 96, <laughs> or now. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think uh, I did listen to all their albums. They, they're, they're okay. But, uh, yeah, I think, I think with Hope for the Dying, what you get is a band that... I feel like if they had been on a bigger label, they may have had more opportunities than they had. I mean, that's no disrespect to Face Down Records. Like, I love that label. But it's this is kind of one of the only bands that's like this on that label. And um, I feel like maybe if they'd been on, like, a victory, like, Between the Buried and Me was, like, that I feel like they would have just gotten a harder push. But we'll get into all of that. Well, before we talk about the legacy of Face Down Records, I want to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, Tune in Radio, Stitcher. So if you have an Amazon Echo or a Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening, and now Dan is going to tell us all about five star reviews. Well, you know, I'm going to pivot a little bit on the five star review thing. Definitely leave us a review if you want to, to let people know how you feel about the show. 
so we could read it on the show. Well, one of the things that I want to focus on that I haven't really focused on before as far as the podcast goes is sharing, sharing, sharing. Sharing is caring, which is an extremely generic thing that everybody says. However, it does hold some truth. If you guys like this podcast and you guys listen every week and you tune in, tell your friends. Tell people that that you think would like the podcast. Share it on their Facebook wall. Share it on Twitter. Share it on Instagram. You know, just share these episodes and, you know, sharing sharing really helps us as far as, you know, like if we if we just keep posting to the same people every single week, the only people that are going to see that are people that only listen to the show, which is great. However, we're just we're just looking to get a little bit more, uh, just a little bit more exposure. So if you guys are sharing the episodes, that is a, a fantastic help for us. And uh, in the upcoming weeks, I will be throwing in little perks for sharing. So I just really thank you guys that shared the episodes anyway, and you guys that have rated, reviewed, and subscribed. It really helps us out, and I'm really happy that uh, that we have our week-to-week listeners like we do. Without you guys, there'd really be no reason to do this show. We got a comment from Brandon Saber Jr. I challenge you, sir, by the way, to a triple threat match with myself and Brandon Kellum. New to the show and have been binging all week. Would love to hear an episode about It Prevails, one of the most underappreciated bands there is. As a fan of Adam Ship and truly believing that they are underappreciated, I concur. It Prevails on the list? Totally. If they're not on the list, we'll add them. We got an email from Lance Allagood. He says, Dan and Joe, really enjoyed this week's show on Cryptopsy. Lord Worm is indeed quite the vocalist. That, sir, is an understatement. Lord Worm (laughs) is the worm, will always be the worm. Everybody's heard about the worm. He goes on to say, I know most of the metal world is going gaga at the moment over the new Tool album, but frankly, I'm more caught up in the new Megla. Check it out here. Do we have a clip of that, Joe? Yeah, I think we can pull something up. Give me just a second here. Not bad. Not bad at all. It's black metal which I'm excited about. So it sounds like shit and everybody loves it? No, it doesn't sound like shit. That's actually what I love about it. Uh, it. It sounds very well produced, but still has that kind of raw black metal feel to it. Raw is definitely a good word for this. Well, it looks like they've got quite a few albums, so we will... Uh, it looks like they have a lot of albums, so we will revisit that soon. He also goes on to write, Also, what do you guys think of the new Cattle Decapitation? And I'm not going to lie, I have not heard the song yet, so uh, let's listen to that. Has Tony Danza, the tap dance extravaganza, returned? <laughs> oh, not quite that. Uh, it sounds like cattle decapitation. I'm pretty excited about it, actually. That comes out on November 29th. Let me just put that on the calendar now. So we can get a Patreon out on that. One dollar a month will get you access to that exclusive album review feed. Now, I got to tell you, Lance Allagood, man, he kind of never has given us a bad recommendation, like ever. I think uh, I think whenever we're doing our Patreon shoutouts, we should start referring to him as Lance Allagood, the king of metal. Ladies and gentlemen, the king of metal, Lance Allagood. Speaking of Patreon, we got two comments on episode 130, Oh Sleeper. Oh my God, Oh Sleeper. Quote Jeffrey De Los Santos, the actual Mac. <laughs> Is that what he said? Absolutely. Nice. He gets it. He was there. He knows. Brian Dean commented, the episode I've been waiting for. Well, Brian, you know we're here for you, buddy. (laughs) And no one else. Just Brian. (laughs) All Brian all the time. I I would love that. We need to get Brian to come down and check out the studio. It's been too long. Absolutely. Tell him to bring his bass. Yeah, we love you, buddy. Bring your bass. We'll record like a face-melting death metal album. And I'll try to scream like Lord Worm through the whole thing. One more. We got a tweet from Shredder to Tigerhawk. Vildiata is a great band. I only wish they would have released more than two albums. You, sir, Jeff, myself, and I think Dan agree they should have released more than that. Totally. I I remember getting to the end of all that and being like, really? That's it? Yep, that's it. That band was a hell of a good time. Speaking of a good time. So, Dan, tell me about Hope for the Dying. Hope for the Dying is a American Christian metal band from Jonesboro, Illinois. They started in 2006 and released their first album in 2008. And yeah, I'm going to call it an album. It's a self-titled EP called Hope for the Dying, but it's over 36 minutes long. It's got seven tracks. It's an album. The long, the songs are long. It's an album. I don't care what anybody says because I'm allowed to break the no EP rule whenever I want to. You can call it an EP. Everything I have says the album is called Hope for the Dying. And you already said it. It's 36 minutes long. Isn't that the expectation of modern metal albums? Usually it is, but as we're going to find out, that's actually pretty short for a Hope for the Dying album. They definitely turn into proto between the buried and me at some point. Yes, they they like to fill up all the space on the disc. 
that disc costs money. Absolutely. I mean, you got to get as much of your stuff out there as you can. Now, the funny story is I bought this album on, uh, I bought this album at Hot Topic, actually. Whenever it first came out, it, it was, the packaging for this really isn't that great. It's like a really shitty, like, digipack thing. And uh, it's kind of frustrating. Like, it has, like a, like, a little rubber nub that you, like, stick the CD on. And it wasn't a big fan of that. But, like, it only cost, like, five bucks. Did they sell it to you on a flash drive? Or no, 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 no. It was uh, six ninety nine. That's not too bad for 2008. Not for what I got. I mean, and I, I didn't really know anything about it other than it was on Strike First Records, which as a lot of people may know, Strike First was like a, um, it was like a tester label for Facedown Records. So if, if your band, if Facedown was interested in signing you, they would throw you on Strike First just to see how well you did. You know, are, are these guys willing to tour? How many units can they sell? You know, that sort of thing before having to make the decision to put them on face down, which was the bigger label. Is this another tooth and nail solid state situation? Not at all, because tooth and nail and solid state are basically the same label, but uh, solid state is just a division where they cover exclusively heavier, like hardcore metal bands. Face down, for the most part, has always been a heavy label through and through. Strike first was just like, we'll spend some money on you but we're not going to give you like the full face down treatment until we know that you can kind of prove yourself. It's like a proving ground. So this is more like the classic NES. Konami already released a game this year, so this one comes out on Ultra Games. No, it's not really like that either. It's <laughs> it's it's just it's it's just what I said it was. Well, uh, my visuals <laughs> are failing on this episode. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's just uh yeah, no, I mean, it's it's literally just what it sounds like. They're just uh, trying the band out. And that is my review of this first album. It sounds like what it is. Well, and it's funny because I, I bought this record, and I had no idea what it sounded like. I just knew Strike First, and I'd bought some other Strike First releases before, like Bloody Sunday and Trauma, and um, I think even the first War of Ages album was on Strike First. And uh, so, like, I, I really didn't know what to expect. Dude on the back in a band photo is wearing an impending doom shirt. So, like, I'm thinking... You're fucking sold at this point. I'm thinking this is going to be totally different than it is. So when I get it home and I pop it in, I'm very, very surprised at what I'm hearing. The first thing that... The first comparison that I made when I first heard it was Shadows Fall. But even then, I think Shadows Fall is still more metalcore than this. City of Corpses... Like has a has a long intro. These guys play riffs that are more reminiscent of stuff like Iron Maiden, you know, like Saxon, like like classic metal bands. Like these guys did their homework on on traditional heavy metal, but it's got that modern production and that modern heaviness. And sure, some of the other things that you mentioned, Joe, are in there. Like between the they've got kind of kind of a between the buried in me, becoming the archetype. What other B bands can I throw out there? Uh, but they, they definitely uh, play a much more progressive style. And I was really surprised by that because really I'd never heard anything like that off of Strike First. When you, when you bought a Strike First Records release back then, it, it, you know, it was hardcore. And this was traditional metal with constant double bass and slight progressive metal elements. Correct. The big thing, too, was, uh, was the clean vocals came in. And even though I don't think that the clean vocals are necessarily special, like it's not like he's the greatest singer ever, but he sounds he sounds good. He he hits the highs that they need to be hit. Um, he doesn't sound emo. He doesn't sound whiny. He just sounds like a guy just doing his best vocal take. And really, as far as the vocals go, that's the only that's the only down note that I'm gonna give this record. The vocals sound a little out of place in comparison with the music, like the screamed vocals. Uh, the scream vocals sound very hardcore, uh, very War of Ages, like very modern metal. And uh, I don't normally have a problem with that, but I just, for whatever reason, his his intonation, the way he screams, the way his voice sounds. Just, just doesn't really connect with me very well. Um, I think he does a good job, and like, there's even songs like uh, on our fallen comrades, you know, at the end where he has that really emotional, um, like the "Tell my father I tried my best," you know, uh, like the the clean vocals sound good when he comes in and starts screaming those lyrics over and over again. It sounds really good, and um, so I mean, I don't think that the vocals are a total miss. But I just kind of like, for this kind of music, I kind of expect something more like an Opeth, you know, like that that guttural commanding, you know, like a, or like even even like becoming the archetype. I think I think that was the perfect mixture, like the perfect blend of 
of, of metalcore screams with like death metal growls. This is like Haste the Day with a keyboard and some classic heavy metal thrown in. Nothing wrong with it. It just shows its age. It's 2008. The general metal scene was getting over popular emo, and this was the first release by the band. It sounds like they put some money into it. They put some time in the studio. It sounds like a band that will be better three years from now. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Like, this is this is still really good, though, as a debut. Uh, the keyboards are really interesting, too, because this is not how bands used keyboards in 2008. How did bands use keyboards, Dan? I don't know, like Under Oath. Or C, End of Destiny, The Thoughtless Existence. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, you know, everybody went for pop keyboards. This is some really good stuff. Like, like having, I feel like having a keyboardist in the band was always kind of a trope for bands in, in the 2000s. Whereas this guy, like, can actually play. And it's very noticeable that he can actually play. And his, his keyboard work is actually part of the overall songwriting process. And this was the late 2000s where people started to really argue about whether or not keyboards should be in metal. Correct. And the answer is they should be. And like Between the Baird and Me, the keyboardist is the vocalist. So that's just kind of a, kind of a fun little, uh, little tidbit about that. But I thought this was a great debut. And honestly, it's one of my favorite Hope for the Dying releases, if only because it's shorter and kind of kind of gets its point across a little bit quicker than the other albums will. Because we're going to roll into 2011, and you're going to start finding out what this band's really about. 2011, Dissimulation. Dissimulation is a progressive death metal record. It's probably their most popular album, and it comes in at a brisk 53 minutes and 59 seconds, which is not too long, but it's, it's significantly longer than the EP. There's a couple of really cool things here. Is I think that the playing, like the level of creativity is much higher on this than it was on the self-titled debut. Like I think you have you have longer song like songs that are hitting in like the seven minute mark and you kind of have this concept the lyrics are also very fucking serious if this isn't a concept album i don't know what is it's got the big over the top orchestral intro which is likely layered keyboards with some percussion thrown in which may or may not have been played on the keyboard but it sounds big it sounds like they're building me up for something bigger than what I'm about to experience. Between the Buried and Me has a way of giving you the scope of the atmosphere right up front. At least then you know how big the album is going to get. This is the stereotypical, it's going to be big. It's going to be big, guys. Just hang in there for another minute and a half. The intro is only two minutes long. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of what I always say. Well, I say this a lot on the show is it sets you up for an experience that you're not necessarily going to get. You know, you see, so you've got you've got really, really over the top keyboards that just dominate this record. Like more so, even like the keyboards were a little bit more in the background on the self titled, and I, and I think that that was kind of a good thing. That they, they busted them out whenever they really needed them. This it's just so part of the music now that there there's no separating it from their sound. They are incredible musicians. The riff ideas that they have on this record are awesome. The clean vocals sound better. Even the screamed vocals sound better. Everything about this record is great, but it's just a little much. I think that was the only issue that I really had with it is that like they definitely have really incredible emotive moments on the on this album where the riffs just work. Like like it'll happen two times maybe in a song where you're listening to it and you're like, "Oh, fuck yeah." Like this is this is how it's supposed to be. But it just seems like they they've incorporated so many different elements into each song that it can kind of be it's not really a jumbled mess. Like and I'm being really nitpicky in here because like this band checks all the right boxes. They don't do anything wrong. The vocals are intense, the drumming is fast. The keyboards accentuate really well. The clean vocals accentuate really well. Again, this band has the potential to be amazing. But right now, I feel like they're still just good. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm already comparing the band to Between the Buried and Me at this point in the discography. The unexpected addition of the classical music hints that they throw into the composition is something that BT Bam has never done. BT Bam sets an atmosphere 
the whole adult contemporary death metal thing <laughs> that they've labeled themselves for many years. I don't know if they still do, but I still love it. This band has the same feeling, but then they throw in just straight classical. It was almost like Ingve Malmsteen, but slower. And I loved it because I hadn't heard progressive death metal bands do that. And then the band just goes right back into the same old tropes. I don't have a name for it other than everything Paul Wagner does on every song. Here's the sweet picking part and the part where I layer the guitar and then we play the riff and it goes fast and the drums go fast. But this band doesn't make you count the same way BT Bam does. It's more consumable for that reason, which is why I agree with you. This is for the classic metal fan. It's just a little bit more thought put into it from a conventional metal or a conventional music standpoint. Well, yeah, it's more metal overall. And I think that's good. I think this satiates people that hate metalcore, unless they just can't get past the vocals. But, like, I don't think that this is tropey metalcore. But I think it is tropey metal. Tropey metal with some tropey metalcore parts. Because, like, you said you liked the classical elements, and I didn't. Like, they didn't do anything for me. And I kind of started rolling my eyes whenever it starts getting that weird classical sound in there. You're like, oh, my God, Sabotage just showed up, and they're talking about the Mountain King again. I'm, you know, Because I'm, I'm still kind of a meathead, so I'm like, guys, I just want to hear fucking breakdowns, you know? But, like, I realized that they, like, for, for where they were as a band, like, at that time, like, in 2011, in a, Chris, in a Christian band, no less, on Face Down Records, this is a hundred times better than it has any business being. Like, you just didn't hear this kind of stuff come out of that scene. Is there any band that did the Between the Buried and Me thing, but then threw in so much classic metal? Not really. Like, the only other band I can really think of to compare Hope for the Dying to in their scene would be something like Becoming the Archetype. And it kind of it kind of reminds me a little bit, like, sound-wise, of like where BTA was going on um, on the physics of fire. It, it has a lot of similarities to that, although I think this is actually more well-produced than the physics of fire. I think I think this, this is a little bit beefier, but I, I hear a very similar vibe with a screaming metalcore vocalist, keyboards in the background, pummeling, riffing, clean vocals. They do the same thing, but I think they actually outclassed, I think they actually outclassed becoming the archetype in this case. Really, the thing that I think adds the most to this, and I, I never say this, but it's the clean vocals really add a lot to this band. And they were they were leaps and bounds better on this than they were on the self-titled. I think really the only issue I have with Hope for the Dying is that you have so many elements that are being mixed together, but they're not being mixed together well. I feel like the song I feel like the songs are just kind of um very kind of start stop like they don't start stop but they're like jaunty if that's a word like they kind of just you go into one thing and then you kind of stop and then you go into another thing and you, you kind of stop and like it's it's all very well put together but it can be a little bit it doesn't it doesn't run smooth like i feel like a good composition should well between the buried and me does the same thing they just do it a little bit faster so is this not as good for you because it's not as frantic like they took the tempo down so that the transition could be more clean but now you're annoyed because you guys changed the riff again maybe i guess it's just yeah it, like because this band is very guilty of playing the most awesome thing ever for about 22 seconds and then they move on to something else that i'm not as into and then i kind of lose it and then they never go back to it so it, it, it can be hard like I don't think it's it's necessarily a, a pace thing, but I think Between the Buried and Me has kind of a random chaotic element to them that Hope for the Dying doesn't have. But let me let me get all nitpicking aside. This band definitely got better between their debut and this. Like they 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 absolutely grew in every way possible to put out a, to put out a way better product. And uh, I'm I, I'm I'm really into this record. This is probably. This is probably like my second favorite by them. I still like the self-titled more because it's a little bit more to the point. And it's it's not quite, uh, for lack of a better term, it's not quite up its own ass as far as uh, as far as being progressive. And I think whenever we roll into their third album, Aletheia, it's almost like they went forward in time, heard this episode, and then went back and fixed it. 2013. Apparently we're not the only group of guys with a time machine. So it's Aletheia. Not to be confused with Alathian. Shout out to Crutch. Absolutely. So this is... We're Opeth now. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Uh, longer than the last album, but only by about three minutes. Or no, it's about ten minutes longer than the other album. I fucking love this album. This is great. The band as a whole 
takes every little progressive metal trope and throws it together in different ways, and they're just not obnoxious. That might sound like a final thought, and it might be by the time we're done with the episode, but you're not expecting this after the last two albums. But right off the bat, the band does the Deliverance Damnation thing, where they just change the pace and play it clean, let the drummer breathe a little bit. He's not just doing some straight double bass shit. They're changing the tone again, but they're controlling it. It's not like BT Bam, where it's loud and big, but it's only this big. This, I still don't know exactly where they're going to go, but I'm expecting the Opeth treatment at this point, and in 2013 especially, that is not a problem. They definitely are more subtle on this record. There's more blending of elements together, and I don't feel like it has the mixed bag feeling that the previous two releases had, where it's like, okay, we gotta throw this in, we gotta throw this in, we gotta throw this in, we gotta throw this in. This was a little bit more like, uh, we're gonna write this and we're gonna perform it, and it's just gonna be an expression of who we are, and we're going to use our technical playing ability to express that. Might sound kind of basic, but like that's that's kind of what it is. It just seems like a more sincere release where they're not trying to prove anything to anybody now. Like they had two releases to show off the like, hey, we can play. Like, and we can play above average from what a lot of our peers are playing. I think there's a lot more like cool groove on this album, like just better riffs, more repetition of those riffs. Keyboards sound really good. Like I just, I love the melodic guitar riffing on this album so much more than the previous. This one doesn't sound jaunty or, you know, stabby. Like they're not trying to inject a whole bunch of different elements in. They still sound like Hope for the Dying, but this is almost like a more realization of that sound. I'm reminded of the second album by Tantric where the guitarist specifically told the drummer, lay into the double bass pedal and just play the fucking groove, man. I don't know if he said that exactly, but that's what I hear in my head. This sounds like we did the classic metal epic concept. And the more I think about it, the more I think Dissimulation had a concept. I just don't know enough about it to tell you exactly what it was. This was, now we're not playing straight the whole time. We're going to lay back. We're going to groove a little bit but it still sounds cleaner than a Between the Buried and Me. And maybe that's just Paul Wagner's guitar playing that makes it sound sloppier, and maybe it's more sincere for that reason. This just sounds like a more clean version of that, but it's Opeth now. It's a little bit Opeth in places, especially the more melodic parts. I'm really a big fan of just the way everything comes together on this record. It's one of those albums that you need to listen to from beginning to end to really get the full effect. You can't just pick and choose out of here because you're going to be missing out. You're going to get a lesser experience. Who let Jeff in the room? Hey, y'all. I, I mean, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. Like you have to listen to it to really to really get it. <laughs> and I, I don't get the I don't get the cheese on this. Like the 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 keyboards aren't so all over the place now that I can't get past them. Like they're still there, but again, I just I, I don't know. I it's really hard to put my finger on, but I just think that this is more progressive because it's not trying to be as progressive we don't have the big mozart keyboard string hits every five seconds dun 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 like you don't have that yeah like it's you know it, they don't come across as the kind of band that's like yeah i was sitting there listening to the moonlight sonata last night and uh i think that uh you know I should, like they're not like that all right dan i got record, an idea but they were that they were those guys on the previous we're release. gonna write music from the 80s but it's gonna be all christmas and people are going to buy it every single year. It's a great idea. No, thanks. Oh, come on, dude. It'll be easy. No, I'm good. No, thanks. I'm going to listen to this Hope for the Dying record. What if we do the Christmas thing and then we do an entire album of Beethoven? No. No, that's the Trans-Siberian Orchestra. End scene. This is... Uh, <laughs> fuck, I didn't even know we were doing a thing. Uh, <laughs> I was just talking. I definitely think this is probably the best of the bunch. I mean, I do. I prefer the self-titled again over everything. I keep repeating that, but it's very true. Um, th and that's not a problem. It's just uh, th this is probably the best, though, from like a, a critical or like a music critic standpoint. Like, I think If you had to pick one and you only had one choice, it would be this one. I think this is their peak for sure. What are we going to say about Legacy 2016? Legacy... This is rough for me because I kind of feel like they went back to the dissimulation sound. I mean, it's my opinion. 
which I'm gonna assume is correct. Um, they they do incorporate a couple of like little folk elements into their sound, which I thought was was odd and kind of unnecessary. Uh, it it sounds positively medieval in places. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I this is rough because there are days that I'm really into this. Like I'm into the gothic metal, folk metal, medieval sounding shit. Uh, unfortunately, I'm just not into that today. And so when I listened to it, you know, when I listened to it this week, I was kind of like, this is cool, but I really like the Lathia. And it's kind of problematic to hear them just throwing more and more elements in, which I understand, like, when you're a progressive band, your goal is to try to be as progressive as possible by incorporating as many different elements into your sound as you can. But it's almost like you've set yourself up to meet an expectation that you can't realistically meet. With all of that in, like, just to, just to kind of go through a list of different metal styles that I've heard on this album. You know, traditional heavy metal, which we've talked about. Um, black metal, folk metal, gothic metal, melodic death metal, and metalcore. Like, that's the, those. That's how much shit you've got going on here. There has to be room for the songs to be good, too. But instead, I feel like it's hope for the dying, but they're just throwing so much shit at the wall here. It took four albums, but now we're at the point where... We've run out of cohesive progressive ideas, and now we're just writing riffs and trying to figure out how it fits together. Correct. It's still better than what I could come up with right now if you asked me to, but it's not as good as other progressive things. I spent a lot of time this week going back to Between the Buried and Me because that was the overwhelming memory that I had listening to this band. When I got to Legacy, right off the bat, in the first five minutes, I said, this is their great misdirect. Yeah. The expectation is up here for it to be colors again, and it just can't be. And you can almost hear it in their playing and how it's recorded and what it sounds like, that they knew that was the expectation and they accepted that they couldn't do it. So they just did the best that they could do on that particular day. It's not bad, I just don't like it as much as the other three albums. I don't either. I think it's not a stinker by any means. Like Joe said, it's better than anything I can fucking come up with. <laughs> you know, and it sounds like we're shitting on the band and we're not. We're just being extremely nitpicky. You really kind of can't go wrong with Hope for the Dying. Like, their shit is all rock solid. Like, it sounds amazing. It's to very, very, like, it's above technically proficient. It's actually very creative in places. I just think that sometimes they double down too much on all of the outlier elements instead of necessarily focusing on their core sound. What is their core sound? Progressive death metal? I think the first, yeah, and I think the first album is that. The self-titled, and that's why I that's why I praise it so much because it's a little bit more to the point. It was before they went like completely off the deep end. And like I said, they're not they're not bad. This isn't a shit release or anything. Like this band's never really messed up. But they've just, they kind of just went too far in a few places, I think. This is the album of guitar noises that you're expected to sit and listen to and enjoy when really it's the riffs that you're waiting for and they just don't happen as often. Correct. And they do happen, though. They're there. It's just not, it's not as compelling as it has been on previous releases. That's all I'm saying. I think this album is the most tropey. This is less classic metal or traditional heavy metal and a lot more we listen to progressive music too guys um what are we gonna do here on bar five well we'll just groove a little bit we'll get kind of toolish there'll be a little vamp on the guitar and the drums will bring the beat down and then i'll just sing this is when you start to hear the tropes that other bands did and are still doing and it just sounds like it's not as good we didn't put as much time into it we came up with good ideas. We came up with good riffs because we accepted them in the process. Once you spend a lot of time writing your first record, you've mentioned it before, your first record is usually the best because you've had your whole life to write it. It's what are you going to do on that follow-up? This band gave you two follow-ups that may not have been your favorite, but were the next step. This is the part where, all right, guys, we're going to write a new album. What do we got? Well, I kind of have this groove thing. Can we vamp on that for a while and see what happens? All right, I can still play off-time beats and play the drums along with that sweet pick. Yeah, we can do that. It's more of the same. It sounds more familiar, but it's not the worst thing I've listened to this year. No, not at all. 
I think this band is, is is great, and I think that for Face Down, they're one of the most unique bands that they signed. There's really not a whole lot of other stuff on Face Down that sounds like this, and I think that's really key when talking about when, when talking about Hope for the Dying is that they were unique in their scene. And I don't know if they're done or not. I, there's not a lot of info on the band out there, so you know I'll I'll try to find that as time goes on. But uh, I, I would love to hear another album by them and see if you know see, see where they go with it. Maybe maybe they've been trapped in a basement crafting this for like you know five years or something. Maybe the lead singer decided to build a new studio, and now the band has been doing that for the past three years. Yeah, right. I know that's. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I guess my final thought on them is just that uh, you should check them out because they are above and beyond. Like if you if you really like stuff like becoming the archetype and between the buried and me and, and stuff like that, like they're definitely the band that you haven't heard that you need to hear. I think Hope for the Dying is that band that reminds you between the buried and me is not a unique oddball out in the corner by themselves playing this style of progressive death metal that is heavily inspired by Dream Theater and other progressive bands, but really is kind of their own thing. Hope for the Dying, they demonstrate that you can do that thing and it'll still sound good. So if you're itching for some more Between the Buried and Me or something like that that you haven't heard recently, you definitely need to listen to this band. Damn, what's your album of the week? My album of the week is in the incredible hardcore album Terminus by the band Circleback. Check these guys out. They just released Terminus on the 30th of August, and it is awesome. If you're in, if you're just into like ball busting hardcore, this band is it. For me, it's Between the Buried and Me, The Great Misdirect. I kept going back. I kept looking for that feeling of this isn't going to be as good as everybody wants it to be. So let's just go with it. Have you guys ever just been sitting there wondering, man, I really want these guys to talk about my favorite band. How do I reach out to them? Well, you know, you guys know that we have a Discord server. You can click on the link in our show notes and take you right there. You know that we're on Facebook under Discography Discussion. We're on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Joe and I have our own Twitters, Discuss Metal Dan and Discuss Metal Joe. We're, we're here for you. You can even send us an email at, at danandjoeshow at gmail.com. We're all over the place, man. Send us send us a message. Let us know how you're doing. And please, share, 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 share. And on that note, this has been Episode 133 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things discography discussion. And please, send questions and comments to Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at Patreon.com forward slash Discuss Metal. We have some sweet perks. Money good! Hope for the dying good! Not everything seems clear The future's not so bright The only chance is not to waste your life Have hope and have no fear The truth walks by your side